has joined in. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the Sri Ram Research Festival 2021, a celebration of ideas hosted by the Economic Society, SRCC. This festival aspires to acknowledge and amplify the drive for unique and authentic research. My name is Astha Jha, and I shall be hosting today's session. In the first webinar for today, we are honored to have with us Ms. Sakshi Pawar from Vidhi. The Vidhi Center for Legal Policy is an independent think tank conducting high quality research to formulate better laws and improve governance. They have been responsible for several impact driven projects, such as the creation of the new bankruptcy ecosystem, drafting of the data protection bill, and the repealing of 119 laws that discriminated against persons affected with leprosy. In today's webinar, Ms. Power shall be discussing whether India's expenditure on mental health is sufficient. This topic holds special relevance, especially in these trying times, and we are honored to host her. At the end of the session, we shall take up a few questions by the audience. Feel free to type in your questions in the chat box, but please refrain from unmuting yourself. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So I'm going to get straight in and then um, share my screen right now. And I'm going to keep it this way and not make it a full screen so that they will need to monitor it. So I'm going to first explain what the intersection between mental health and law and economics is. As you all know, it's pretty simple. Considering what's happening with COVID right now, we are seeing that in developing countries, the fact is that poor mental health will affect the economics of the country, where you will have lower income in the country. The other way around as well, where poor mental health expenditure in developing countries affects the mental health services that you get because social inequalities also play a huge role. Social and income inequalities play a huge role in the country's uh, mental well-being, and also the fact that you are not able to access resources effectively. The third point is that this has been in exacerbated during COVID. And the point is that during COVID, it's shown that lower income countries, again, were affected much greater in terms of inequalities, so greater mental health, and the fact that you know lesser resources were there, so that also exacerbated the problem. These are the three points essentially which really create the scenario for why we are discussing this here today. It's important to note before I start the session that the real reason why I put this up is that India shows a very slow, like India has lesser than 1% of the mental health expenditure that's actually required. And this can be a problem because I'll show you later on, I'll share a link with you guys. Most countries spend at least 1% of their health budget on mental health. However, this is not the case with India. We spend about 0.8% of our health budget on mental health. However, even when you spend such a small amount of money, this money is still being underspent. And in fact, India cuts the budget for mental health every single year because it's underspent. And this really creates the question of, you know, if we are really demanding better mental health services, uh, um, and we're still seeing the fact that, you know, we're understanding on these services, then what's really the problem? That's what we're going to be discussing today. I'm going to be raising three fundamental questions of economics at this point in this session. The first is that, is there really a need to increase allocation of resources for mental health in India? The second is that if we do have a need to increase the allocation of resources, what is it that the government needs to see to increase those allocation of resources? And third, alternatively, considering we're a developing country and expecting an increase in budget for mental health is difficult, what can we do to ensure better allocation of resources that we have cut? I'm also going to be touching upon a wide variety of points. I'm going to be discussing the laws and policies on mental health in India, how they're being implemented, what parts of India suffer from mental health problems, et cetera, what tools we're going to use to understand mental health. There are lots of technical terms as well that come into play here, and how developing countries need to improve their policy services, specifically developing countries, actually. Their state is quite different from developed countries when it comes to mental health services, so how we need to keep in mind developing countries and their economics and policies to ensure better services. The last point, all the data, so I've put a lot of links in the session and I'll keep sharing them with you guys, but it's really important to know that all the data that's mentioned in these 
um, links that I'm sending you that you need to take them with a grain of salt because um, data collection for mental health is really difficult to do. There's a lot of stigma attached to it. Also, most of these reports come from places like WHO, et cetera, where maybe their understanding and their question is when they come in developing countries, it's possible that they are not able to adequately, accurately collect data or know how to collect data from the places that they need. Sometimes there is definitely a data discrepancy that we see. Sometimes um, not all understanding, not all uh, economic burden should be like, for example, I mentioned somewhere in the session that, you know, we have a $1 trillion economic burden. We will have a $1 trillion US dollar economic burden of, uh, in India because we're not dealing with our mental health crisis. But even that is maybe a much smaller number than it needs to be because we are, we are not, we are not, have completely out-of-pocket expenditure for our health, as opposed to how it is there in other countries. So it's definitely important to note that maybe when you're looking at foreign resources, that they don't accurately ref reflect the mental health crisis that is going on in India right now. Okay, now I'm going to proceed with the rest of the points that I have. I'm going to be, when you, uh, when I'm going to share these resources with you, it may not be completely relevant for the purpose of this PowerPoint presentation itself and this session, but it's important for you to know when you look at these resources that you will constantly come across terms such as YLDs, YLLs, or DALIs. I'm not sure if you've studied them in economics yourself, but essentially, DALIs is a term right here, which is used to measure mental health gaps or gaps in what should have been ideal life expectancy. And they show, so DALIs is essentially, it has two components to it. One is YLL and one is YLD. YLD is basically years lost due to less than optimal health because of your disability. That's one part. And the second part is loss of years due to premature death. Now, while these are both important because suicides and a lot of other disabilities affect uh, you know, can cause premature death when you have mental disorders, it is often noted that the predominant factor that really affects uh, DALIs in when you look at mental health. So DALIs is actually this term, disability adjusted. It's called disability adjusted life years. Disability adjusted life years can be applied to all ranges of disability. However, in policy, usually, when you look at mental health services or when you look at mental health problems, you measure them in terms of disabilities, which is what we're going to be doing for this session as well. So in this case, disability adjusted life years is affected more greatly by YLDs, which are years lived with disabilities, because most mental health disorders you will find are non-fatal. So YLDs plays a greater role as opposed to the premature deaths that have happened. YLDs being the years lived with disabilities or less than optimal rates. And uh, I'll explain how YLDs and YLs are calculated as well. But uh, that's, like I said, generally not very important for the session. But it is important for you to know, if you start reading the papers that I've sent to you, that they play a huge role in determining which country is being affected greatly by mental health and which is being affected lesser by mental health. YLL is calculated as a standard. YLL is basically the number of deaths in that country multiplied by the standard life expectancy at the age of when the death happens. Standard life expectancy at, at birth is usually around 80 years for everyone, but usually social factors, etc., and resources are like, for example, the WHO has different standard life expectancies at different ages. So that also plays a role in determining what the YLL number will be. And the YLD number which is more important for us to know than the YLL number, which is years lived with disabilities, is basically takes into account the number of years actually that disability will affect you, the severity of the disability, and the number of cases that usually actually are disabled. So that's a fairly like simple way to understand and a very good metric to determine how many people are affected by disability and to what severity in which country. Now, while I mentioned DALIs as a term for this session, it's also important to know that DALIs is not entirely relevant, maybe in economic terms. 
because values is very important for a country to know also for like policy perspective to understand which where they need to spend their global health where their health expenditure needs to go that's very really important for them but values does not take into account a very important point of the economic burden of out of pocket expenditure so the economic burden in my household if uh, the economic burden of having a disabled person in the household getting their drugs or any other healthcare treatment that is not counted as you can see in dalis so there is no really economic uh, it's a time measure dalis but it's not really an economic measure so usually when you see reports and you'll see like one like the country will have this loss of money etc there are varying ways in which they calculate this loss of money and one of them is like usually it's the average annual income of the person or people in the country etc or the gdp of the country that is So now I'm going to explain what the mental health statistics for India are. But like I've mentioned, we need to take this with a grain of salt. So India actually has way higher, and I'll share some things with you so you can see them. But they're very technical links, so it's going to be difficult either way for you to understand. I'm just trying to resize this window. And it's very such um is the chat open for me to Yes, ma'am, for sure. You okay. can put it in. Yeah. All okay. right. So you can look at this thing, and that will help you. And I'll share other links as well. What you see in India is that we have a really high suicide rate in India. It accounts for nearly thirty-six percent of the world suicide rate, which is a huge problem. And recent reports are coming out. So first, that we are seeing a set of reports which talk about adolescents and mental health and how they're affected. And the WHO has actually put up two reports. One is general for children, and one is for adolescents. In India, they measured it between the thirteen to fifteen rate. And um, I'll send this one also. This is page thirty-three of this report. Is where you see what the statistics are. Is that we have still we are still showing one of the highest suicide rates, even in adolescents in the country. And most of these are marked by depression and anxiety-related disorders. That's important to know. The survey, in terms of um, these, like in, in terms of determining what disorders actually affect India, the data can get skewed really fast because in men, actually, it shows men which actually are more susceptible uh, and are more, you know, are open about discussing mental health, etc. Which I'll show you later on. Women actually show strong perceived stigma in terms of in terms of showing mental health or discussing mental health even in surveys. You will see that men have a much higher incidence for are more susceptible to suicide, yes, but they are also more susceptible to things such as substance abuse. Whereas a lot of the other or illnesses such as anxiety and depressive disorders are really important part, but you don't find common linkages between them and suicide, or they're not very often discussed in the context of India. And this can definitely definitely be a problem that is associated with the data collection that we have. So, like I mentioned, you have a we have a really high suicide rate in India, and most of our cases actually come from uh, depression and anxiety related. And I've shared the links with you as well. So, when you're looking at these links, 
For example, if you look at the WHO one, I'm sorry, is there a question that needs to be asked? All right, okay, I'll continue. So if you look at the WHO section that I've shown, in the introduction part, they talk about how we have, because of, um, like in India as well, there's about 15 to 20% of the delis for that age, for that age are caused by the mental health disorders, which essentially means that the disability, 15 to 20% of the years that are actually uh, where students spend less than optimal, spend their life in less than optimal health is actually affected by the mental health disorders that they may face. That is a really significant portion that needs to be addressed. And that's why this context becomes important. And these are just the adolescent and child surveys for the ages of 2021 20, right now. We're still looking at a really huge mental health crisis in these past two years in terms of the adult, in terms of women population as well, that needs to be discussed. The National Mental Health Survey, it was conducted uh, last about in 2015, 2016. That's the data that I'm seeing. And in that, it's shown that in urban areas, you will see two to three times the higher incidences of general common, common mental health disorders, for example, anxiety and depression, as opposed to rural areas. But like I said, that needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Also, generally, when you read upon all this information, you will see that men, men access mental health resources. So there were a lot of, uh, you know, helplines that came out during this entire time. And men were accessing it far more than women were. And there's this Indian Journal of Psychiatry report in around 2018, which spoke about how women actually do not access mental health resources or understand it because there's such a strong stigma surrounding it. So that definitely, like I mentioned, skews the data on that. The next question that we have is, what do these statistics actually mean for India? So I'm going to share this really nice World Economic Forum report with you, which discusses what non the burden of non-communicable diseases on India and its norm. And it says that India is bound to see a loss of 1.03 trillion US dollars by 2030 if it does not address mental health disorders alone within the country. And this is a really considerable portion of, uh, you know, like loss of economy. And if you continue, actually go ahead next and see the amount of health expenditure that we have, that we put into mental health, you will see how shockingly low it is to this particular amount. And that even small differences in that mental health expenditure could really easily reduce the great burden that we will be facing in some time. So as you can see right here, it's mentioned that actually that the government is actually quite late in terms of addressing mental health disorders because now the burden and the amount of money that we have to put in to actually change this is not really going to match up to the productivity loss that has, we have already happened. So we're pretty late in addressing mental health and the loss of economy that's going to happen from it is pretty stark. We are probably not going to be able to actually avert it entirely. Okay, that's great. Now I'm going to talk about India's laws and policies governing mental health. So in 2017, so now I've been talking about how disabilities, uh, mental health, and the discussion on mental health usually falls under disabilities, right? And that's quite reflected within men India's Mental Health Care Act as well. If I just open that for you guys. I'm not sure if you can see it. Can you see the act that I've just opened up? No, ma'am. I think you haven't shared uh, your entire screen. I'm just. Yes, this. I am done. Right. So, this act was actually come came into place after the United Nations Conventions on Disabilities, and we've had this act since 2017. So it's a really recent act. And it's quite different from the previous acts that we've had before, because previously we really did not look at mental health patients in terms of a more humanitarian perspective, et cetera. And what's 
fundamental about this entire act that's really changed everything is the fact that there is a right to mental health care in this embodied release act. So it essentially says that you as a citizen should be, if you are suffering from a mental illness, particularly, this is very important for the terms of the act. Mental illness is defined in the terms of The mental illness, as you can see, they only talk about substantial disorders of thinking, which impairs your ability to work, impairs your judgment, etc. There is no standardized definition, but this is the broad definition that they provided about, you know, having a substantial impairment in, in your way of living would be considered a mental illness. And that is what actually this act is covering. So I'll be honest and say that, you know, if you are probably suffering from anxiety, depression, that does not fall within this habit, you cannot be covered by the act. But what's still really good here is that for all these things, like for example, the substantial amounts of like, you know, substantial disorders that you can have, they actually grant a right to the person to have within a very close distance to them any healthcare system or any hospital that can actually give them mental health care treatment. That is a fundamental change that was there since 2017. However, as you've seen with COVID, etc., and I was even working on this in Maharashtra, we have noticed that that is just simply has not happened. We have only four med med uh, mental health institutes in Maharashtra itself, and creating and establishing a mental health care institute takes the roads of money. Okay, now we're probably going to have a sixth one in Jharkhand. But that's still not enough. Maharashtra is geograph geographically huge. And to essentially have only six mental health institutes, that too with a very small number of psychiatrists. WHO says that there should be one in every 1,000 people. There should be a psychiatrist for them. However, that number is really not being matched. In fact, we're less than about, I think, 0.5% of that number. So that's a, we have a very little number of psychiatrists. And the amount of money that will actually take to set up these institutes is Point is not something feasible and not something that you can even expect the government to spend on. You can safely say that this act is not truly been implemented the way it should have been, even though the act is pretty much perfect. It covers nearly everything you need in terms of ensuring women are kept safely, women are not discriminated against, you know, there's all protection offered to them. You have all your rights as a mentally ill person to be, uh, you know, ensure that you are kept safely, that all your property, etc., will not be disturbed, that you will not be physically harmed no tonsuring, no forced shaving of hair, you will not be shattered. All of that is embodied within the act. It's quite perfect that way. And the WHO has taken note. So there is this WHO checklist actually on ensuring that all the rights are perfectly embodied within acts. And they have noted that India's act actually does match the WHO checklist. But that's perfect. And we've gotten that point covered. Like I said, however, the implementation of this requires a lot of money. And you can clearly see that that implementation has not happened. Oh, my voice is echoing. Is that? Um... No, ma'am, it's all red. Oh, all right. I'll continue. Right. So that's definitely something that needs to be taken note. The second point that you have, and now I'll share my model. The second point that we see is the National Mental Health Program and the District Mental Health Program. And this is actually more important than the Mental Health Care Act. The National Mental Health Program. National Mental Health Care Program actually came about quite far back in 1982 and it's been supplemented by other programs like the District Mental Health Care Program in 1996. Now, what the National Mental Health Care Program seeks to do, and this is essentially important, is that it seeks to create smaller, more focused men mental health care services, which can be found in the grassroots levels, for example, district levels, etc and basically create more psychiatrists or more counselors that can avail of these services. So it's a grassroots implementation of the Mental Health Care Act. What's really important also is that it seeks to battle stigma and um, it covers a wide range of things and not just uh, mental problem, mental health problems of a substantial amount, 
but general common mental health disorders, for example, anxiety and depression, and treatment for that is also covered by the National Mental Health Care Program. However, this is not found within the Act or not reflected in the Act. It's not necessarily a right that you can actually go and contest in court or you can argue for. And that's really important as well, because like if you imagine the National Mental Health Care Act, which is an act which right now, if you look at the Supreme Court, there's actually been a bunch of cases where people have gone up and said that, you know, the act is not being implemented and the court is requiring states to ensure that the act is implemented. But that is difficult to do in terms of the National Mental Health Care Program because it's a program which is dependent on the budget of the government and the expenditure that they can actually put into it. It's not necessarily a right that you can go and argue for and ensure that it is provided to you. So while it is the accurate answer to our mental health care problem, you'll find that it is also not being implemented well. And in fact, I was recently reading a news article which said that Mumbai is finally implementing the district mental health care program. The district mental health care program has additional points to it. For example, it looks at spending or counseling, spending on counseling services through schools, etc. as well. So there is a better grassroots implementation through the district mental health care program and the national mental health care. There's this checklist that was created by Atlas in 2017. It's very succinct, and that's actually what you need to know. So I was talking about all the statistics, number of psychiatrists we have, the number of people who are affected by mental health disorders, etc. That's very easily mentioned in this report. Atlas actually puts out reports almost every year, so you can try and find a more recent report as well for it, although the numbers, as far as I remember, have not changed much. And you're pretty much looking at the same situation that was there when the Mental Health Care Act came out versus now. So when you look at the Mental Health Care Act and in this Mental Health Care Program, you will see that there's not much in terms of legal policy that I can offer right now. Um, the only problem really is the fact of implementation, and that's really causing a huge problem. And really, in cases of mental health especially, it's not really a problem that the Act can solve as much as like an expenditure-based problem or understanding how resources need to be used that can actually save the mental health crisis that we are facing currently. I'm just now going to talk about India's mental health budget, budget allocation. So despite the fact that we've gone through COVID, we don't see much of a difference in the mental health care budget allocation. It's still lesser than 1%. That's quite less actually, because if you look at this, this is 2013 data that WHO had put out, which lists all countries and most countries at least have 1% of, um, of their health budget allocated for mental health. But I see here that India has less than that, it has 0.8% currently of its health budget allocated for mental health. And what's even more important is most of this money actually goes to two. So like I mentioned here, only 7% of this goes to the National Mental Health Care Program, which is what India needs presently to actually address the problem. It's a it's all the money that can be spent on improving grassroots services for ensuring that mental health is accessible to all and is present there across, like across geographically easily accessible for all. However, you will see that most of the money actually is spent on two institutes. One is Nipans, which is the main institute in Bangalore for mental health or research and for mental health training. And the other one is another institute in this group. Overall, the budget for the National Mental Health Care Program currently stands at 40 crore only, which is an incredibly dismal number. And this is, even if you look at the past data, you will understand that the reason why it's standing at 40 crore right now is a few years back, they'd actually put in a base amount of about 50 crores to start off the National Mental Health Care Program. And the amount has been reducing because only about 5 crore of that amount actually gets spent. That's like a very small number considering what we actually need to fix the problem. So there's definitely a very skewed problem of uh, uh, you know, mental, the way the budget is allocated is definitely very skewed. And the reason for such budget allocation is definitely problematic as well, because merely seeing under expenditure does not, should not, or cannot actually automatically wait to assume, assuming that we have to spend less in that area 
as opposed to understanding why there is such under expenditure in that area. Right, so we've talked about what exactly is like, do we actually need a greater mental health expenditure in India? It's definitely certain. So when you look at actually the 500 crores that's been allocated to Nimhat, et cetera, that is also very important money that needs to go to, these, go to these institutes because they have psychiatrists, they do training, they do research and they need to pay all this stuff. So increasing resources for mental health research, for training and for staff funding is also very important and for creating institutes. However, clearly, while that definitely needs to be done, you're also looking at heavy under expenditure for the National Mental Health Program. Most states in India don't, most districts actually in India don't have a mental health care program that can actually be used or seen to ensure that the money that is allocated under the National Mental Health Care Program is spent properly by them. And that clearly shows that, you know, if you actually look at all the districts in India, then certainly 40 to 50 crores is not sufficient. Right. So you do have a problem of under expenditure. There needs to be increased allocation. So that was the first question that we were looking at. Is there a need for increased allocation at all for mental health, for mental health expenditure in India? That's definitely there. The second point is, how do we convince the government that actually you are looking at, you know, a mental health crisis and you need to improve it? Well, for that, there is studies, which is the term that I was talking about before, where you can look at now, since 2017, multiple reports have come out, which show that, you know, a considerable portion of the population is suffering from going through, like, almost 15 to 20% of the population actually is suffering from um, lesser of, of suffering from disability aborted or uh, disability adjusted life years. It basically means that you're having your ears cut down or years lived in optimum health considerably cut down because of mental health problems. That answers the second prong of the question that, you know, okay, the government needs to increase the allocation and this is why the government should increase the allocation because it is forming a considerable part of the uh, mental, um, of considerable health problem that is prevalent in it. Okay, so now if you all like, we can actually discuss if you want, um, you can ask some questions at this juncture because from now I'm going to go into explaining how we can actually improve the mental health um, situation in India and how you can improve policies and services according to that. So if you would like, you can all definitely ask questions. Like that. Yes, one, but like two or three questions that we'll ask and then you can move on and we'll probably ask a few more at the end again. Uh, there's one which is, uh, you know, often the often mental health as a concept is reserved for the privileged class. And you've rightly pointed out that, you know, it obviously impacts those of poor social, socioeconomic background as well. So how can the government assure to limit the opportunity cost of taking time out to probably indulge in, not indulge in, but, you know, of take like take up self-care activities, afford therapy, take rest days, all of that, because they're already in such a poor condition. So how does how does the government or any policy ensure that they aren't severely negatively impacted, even the, in the economic way uh, in that context? That's one question. Okay. All right. So that's definitely an interesting point. Actually, there's not much research that does reflect that. In terms of research and understanding how mental health expenditure needs to take care, and I will explain that later, it mostly looks at just the average annual income of the person versus the tallies, which is the disability adjusted life years that can be aborted. Basically, if they see that one year of poor health can be aborted at a cost which is lesser than the average annual income of a person in India, then it makes sense for you to actually put money into that service or that resource. This is for common health, mental health problems that are there for anxiety and depression, etc. Now, within that, now you can hope that you know things such as the uh, when you talk about opportunity cost, that does in some form maybe reflect into the average annual income that a person is gaining. But honestly, I'll be very real with you. There is not enough research on that. If you're talking about the time cost that it takes to take therapy, etc., and whether or not that affects a person's average annual income, et cetera. That is not how far research has gone. And that could also probably be because people in developing countries like India don't, are not willing to spend enough money on research to that extent to find the answer. 
but that's still a really valid point. Uh, Ma'am, there's one question that I think I'll ask uh, Neyati Fitkariwal and the audience to unmute and ask. So Neyati, you can go ahead. All right. Thank you, Vartha. So Ma'am, uh, from an economic standpoint too, we see that mental health has far-reaching consequences. So if economics is essentially the subject of rational decision-making and optimizing uh, productivity, a deteriorating mental health should be a major concern of economics, con uh, economists considering that if the mental health is not um, very good, you might make compromised decisions. And also, again, we see how mental health and economics often feed into each other in the sense that if you are suffering from anxiety disorders or uh, other mental health problems, you might be facing lower productivity and also lower productivity can make you more um, kind of susceptible to bad mental health problems. So given all this, um, what I want to ask is why do you think mental health is still majorly ignored by both our government and the economists? It's still very underfunded and um, and lastly, inadequately addressed from a policy standpoint. Also, what policies um, could be framed that would account for the same? And how do you think such policies can be brought about in India? That's a really good question. And I'm not going to simplify to say the answer is stigma because I don't think it is. I think the answer is mostly that there are two ways to look at it. First is cost-benefit analysis in a country like India. If you look at vaccination, for example, so you say that, okay, uh, for vaccination, the amount of money that is spent in vaccination versus the benefit of vaccination is so obvious that the government is bound to spend money on it. That is sometimes not very easy to see in the case of mental health problems, right? And what all these reports actually do, for example, the WHO, when they put out reports, they try to explain that, they try to show that which diseases, for example, are talking about uh, treatment for AIDS. So a lot of reports mention the fact that, you know, okay, these kind of treatments for AIDS, the kind of you're spending money on that as a country and the kind of output you're getting, that is actually, that cost-benefit analysis can actually match to a lot of mental health services that you can offer. So they do economic analysis of certain services and how you can match them to mental health services to make the government understand that, okay, you will see valued output, even though you don't recognize it immediately, you will actually see valued output for spending this amount of money. However, like I said, in a, that's more, that's probably something that a developed country would probably understand better. In India, we, when you talk about, for example, if I went to the government today, I said that you know, these are these mental health problems and you're seeing them in rural areas because of so-and-so reason. So Maharashtra has high rates of pharma suicide, very, very high. Rates. The government is more likely to look at the cost-benefit analysis for addressing the root cause of pharma suicides, for example, paying loans to farmers, et cetera, which probably would give them better cost benefit, like better results in that angle, rather than spending on things like mental health services, which do fall in a country like India. It's not because of stigma. It's just that the benefit to them for spending money is more obvious for a lot of other things than it is for mental health services. That's essentially the answer. Thank you so much, Ram. That was really helpful. I'll ask one more and then you can move on. Uh, there's one about how Indian work culture is generally you know, known to push the eight-hour day shift uh, which often ne negatively impacts a worker's mental health. Has the government taken any steps that ensure that if employees, you know, put their foot down uh, against like this sort of practice, they won't face repercussions? That's a really good point. Uh, no, our labor laws probably don't cover a lot of the private companies that you're looking at. And I'll be very honest with you, that's not going to happen. The, co the problem isn't maybe our laws and stuff like that. Uh, it's mostly the fact that even a lot of people that you're surrounded by would be willing to work the extra hours even though they don't have to. And that's a really that's a real problem in India. So no, I don't think that's going to be something that even though, like I've said, this is when you look at mental health, it's a lot that can be addressed in terms of where the mental health problems are actually coming in India because it's not necessarily hormonal or genetic. It's actually, you know, common disorders due to societal factors, which is what you can concentrate on. However, um, a lot of these things can't be changed in a developing country like India. It's not really a law-based problem, or even, I don't know if it's a policy-based problem. It's maybe like a cultural issue. That's that. Thank you so much, Ram. You can move on. Awesome. So, um, right. So, I'm actually on my last slide, but I'm going to take a lot of time. Now. So, what happens in the case of mental health disorders, like I was talking, 
when you look at common mental health disorders like anxiety and depression, the measure that the WHO has put up, and I'm going to share these two really important resources with you. Ma'am, I think you're muted. Sorry? It's fine now. I think there was some yes. All right. So, uh, I put up those two resources and they're both really important. They discuss the economics of mental health and how WHO actually analyzes mental health problems and how they affect the economy. So, those are two very good resources that you need to look at. But I'm going to go ahead and simplify them and explain them for you right now. The WHO essentially sees one of the main points that this is of common mental health disorders. It has to match, for example, one D disability adjusted life, you know, which is called a voluntary. One, if one daily is aborted under within the range of one person's average annual income, then it means that that service is worth going for. And the way the average annual income is calculated is, of course, as per the country's average annual income. Right? So that's really, and then they can divide that by looking at how much a developed country can spend, how much a developing country can spend. That's really important. That's the first thing to look at. The second thing is, for um, diseases that require drugs, for example, psychotropic drugs, etc., we change that because drugs for mental health are very, very expensive. And that's definitely a huge problem, but we are not even at the stage of considering the fact that we are at a problem of you know people not getting access to mental health drugs because we are at a greater, like we are at a much more fundamental position than that. So for access to mental health drugs for like mental health actually. Um, actual mental health institution, in, institutionalization, you will see that the cost is about three years of average annual income to one year of daily that is averted. That means that it's definitely much higher. And that's how they actually measure this. What they've seen is for developing countries, they've noticed that usually when you spend money, so for developing developed countries, they've seen that a good mixture of about, you know, ensuring that psychosocial treatment, which, which is essentially your general counseling treatment, Along with all of this, you know, uh, uh, you know, this treatment that's offered in the form of drugs, when you combine those two in the accurate amounts, by spending about 50 percent of those, you will see the best mental health expenditure that there is. However, that gets skewed when you actually come to developing countries, where you will see that for developing countries, you cannot fall like like paying emphasis on actually providing drugs and treatment, etc., to exceed the value of uh, the three years of average. Annual. And then it becomes very difficult for a country to pay attention to those, those services. The country has to pay attention in greater numbers to services such as which offer general counseling or psychosocial treatment. When you look at psychosocial treatment, and then the next problem that we come at is the fact that we have a heavy shortage of counselors and psychiatrists across India. We have very few institutions. There's not enough services available for this. So that is the first problem that we really have to address. And if you look at a lot of psychiatrist interviews in India for what is really the problem for mental health care in the country, they will tell you that people talk about how awareness needs to be increased, etc. And he's like, for I look at 40 to 50 patients per week. I'm really overspent in looking at, you know, just severely mentally ill people in institutions every single week. I do not have the scope to, you know, go out spread awareness, etc. So we're definitely short of psychiatrists rather than actually being short of institutions, etc. etc. The second thing that you've done to actually improve this, and that was the full point of the National Mental Health Care Program, the District Mental Health Care Program, which is something a lot in developing countries use. So that's called the MHCAP program, I believe. It's by the WHO, and India has been using it before itself, which is we increase our community workforce. So we have uh, people known as ASHA workers, which are the community workforce of India. And essentially, ASHA workers are also empowered to ensure that they do checkups on farmers, etc. For example, in the Maharashtra district, I take the example of in the Vidharva region, we had a huge portion of farmer suicide. So Tata Trust got in touch with these ASHA workers. They knew that they had you know, some basic counseling idea. So they actually worked with them closely for a year or two or so to ensure that this farmer suicide rate dropped. ASHA workers is in fact or in ensuring community or spending money through community workforce and empowering them with basic knowledge of mental health care is in fact the best way to deal with this problem. That's what we really need to actually fix this fix the situation. However, ASHA workers themselves in India until very recently, and this was a problem in COVID, is that they're heavily underworked, that they're heavily underpaid and overworked. 
In fact, during COVID, to ensure that vaccination is done, to ensure that quarantine is done, you will see that a lot of government teachers and a lot of Asha workers were being made to spend, like they were essentially losing money, traveling, etc. They were not able to uh, cope, like it was not matching with the salary. They had to spend greater amounts of money ensuring that their work was actually done because the government just kept finding work on them and not using it that way. So if you really want to address this problem, it's better to create a separate cadre of community healthcare workers, which can actually, you know, probably put, and you can have different training services in countries, in Mumbai, in different training services, in Pune, for example, and in different rural areas. When you pick up community workforce, people from the community itself, it's better because they know which mental health disorders or mental health problems are more prevalent in that area because of the context or the social context of that area. And if you empower them, it's much easier to have the problem solved at a much lower budget cost. For that, of course, the NMPH budget exactly is what needs to be increased. That has not been done yet. But once it is done, you will see that, you know, there are lots of reports that they describe this in US dollars, etc. that for every $1 spent, you get a $3, $4 return on ensuring that community workforce system is actually put through. The second thing that you see are school outreach programs, which is the next best option that you have. So the district mental health or, or program also mentioned this, is that a lot of the problems that we have in India, for example, common mental health disorder problems, they start from the age of adolescence, which are which can actually lead to things like substance, which is found to lead to things like substance abuse, et cetera, later on. So it's much better if you actually do community social out, school outreach programs and ensure that children themselves have access to these. So both of these things, actually, community workforce and school outreach programs, one of the bigger problems that they first have to start with is stigma. Out of all the other countries that um, these reports, for example, w, UNSF has recently come up with a report on children. And it stated that Indian children especially face higher uh, lack of acceptance of mental health issues and they're less likely to reach out for mental health problems. So even if you put a counselor maybe in a school, maybe it will not solve the problem. You will definitely have to spend money to ensure that stigma, like the stigma is, you know, has gone away, that awareness is spent, and then you can go ahead and addressing mental health problems. The fourth one was, especially during um, the, like things like, for example, COVID, is that they noticed that family healthcare was family uh, protection and planning was what was really important. So families were greatly affected by not just the primary caregiver. The primary caregiver either passed away or he lost his primary source of income and other people in the family were greatly affected by it as well. And they noticed that a huge portion of the suicides, et cetera, were actually prevented by ensuring that not just the primary caregiver who is greatly affected by uh, loss of job during COVID, et cetera, or fears his you know, health, et cetera, in COVID, it's actually protecting the family as well. Which is really important. So family plan, family outreach is also another thing, which essentially gets covered under community workforce idea. So community workforce, when you look at the social school outreach and the family, um, you know, healthcare idea, both of them get covered. That. That's really the crux of this problem. And then only after that can you look at increased access, increasing access to medication. You see, currently in India, if you go to a government hospital, you can still or a private hospital, you can still get funds for certain kinds of or insurance government insurance for a lot of things. What you don't get government insurance for easily is mental health. This is a considerable problem that you have that is addressed by the Mental Health Care Act, which says that mental, like every government service or insurance service that now has to be offered, has to, we have to be asked questions on mental health, et cetera, and given the option or you know, include that, include mental health problems and payment for that as part of the insurance plan as well. Was not being done up to now, but now with the Supreme Court orders, etc., they are starting to include mental health services as part of insurance as well, which is really a huge deal in a country like India. Okay, uh, I'm just going to discuss some other terms with you. I've skipped over them, I'm, I'll have finished the session quite soon, I think it's fine actually. So, I'll talk about the terms that you really need to look at in India when you're discussing it. Uh, one of them is treatment gap. It's mentioned that India has a considerable portion of about an 80% treatment gap where you have high number of people affected by mental health and lot of, less number actually awaiting the services. So that's a number, that's a point that you see coming up very often in terms of understanding whether or not money needs to be spent on mental health services. Treatment gap is the first point. The second point that you're looking at is essentially intervention affordability, which was talking about what portion of an average annual income and actually the government afford to spend on like averting damage, et cetera. So those points are called intervention affordability. 
And that's another term that usually comes up when discussing uh, how money needs to be spent on mental health service. Okay, I think I've covered almost all points. However, if you have, I'm fairly uh, familiar with the Mental Health Care Act and its underlying programs. So if you want to ask me any questions, please do so right now. I'll definitely answer. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, Maithli Sharma from the audience would also like to ask a question. So Maithli, you can go ahead. Um, yeah, am I audible? Yes. Um, yes. Hello. Hello, yes, you're audible. Yeah, you're audible. Okay. Yeah, so my question was uh, the fact that you just spoke of that uh, in India especially, there's a lot of stigma associated with talking about mental health and wellness, which also uh, to some extent reduces a person's productivity, even in a corporate sort of framework. So uh, how do you think the new age work ethics must evolve in order to become more sympathetic towards mental health and also include that in the uh, policy side of things? Hmm. How do we include that in the policy side of things? That's a really good question. And I wonder how that will get done, actually. To be honest, even if you look at the government services themselves, you barely ever see. The government services are actually fairly uh, fair in terms of their timings and the costs and the money that they offer, etc. And you don't offer, offer, we not offer the healthcare, mental health problems related in government services. So I can understand why government policies themselves do not include this aspect because I think that that's not the problem. That's not really where the problem exists. Um, I think that this point, like in private companies and policies to be created for that. To be fair, actually, now that I've been working, and I don't know how many of you are, any of you working, I don't think so, I'm not sure. But uh, since I've started working, Vithi, for example, has proper mental health care policies and they offer services for mental health now since COVID started. All of the law firms that I was looking at, at least most of them that I've worked at, so I've seen that they've all also included mental health services in their, um, in their, you know, sub, like in their additional benefits that are offered, that you can avail free counseling, et cetera, or that you can ask for mental health leave and that is perfectly accepted, part of the leaves that you can take and that's an excuse and that's a reasonable condition for you to make. So all of this awareness, et cetera, workshops on this, we have... Since then, policies, all companies have actually started. I don't think any company is not doing it because it just looks bad. But I don't see how you can find that in terms of like, you know, in the Mental Health Care Act or anything else, like in law or in policies per se. I find that so difficult and I don't think that's going to be included anytime soon because it's not a pressing need. And in fact, in India, actually, like I was saying, the problem that you see usually is in rural areas and how they are not getting the right kind of mental health services. If I went right now, the government now is like with urban areas and people in people live urban populations actually need better, better mental health care services. They are not going to really be happy with it and not are uh, not are they going to be willing to spend time and energy to figure out the right answer for it. As opposed to when I tell them that in rural areas, you know, uh, this is a huge problem in Bihar as well. Like for example, people in Bihar actually did stand up for mental health care, etc. when they realized that maternity rates but like there was high maternal deaths and you know uh, like maternity birth related deaths and also like there was child like children were dying fairly early on in the infant infant mortality was very high and they found that the best way to fix that was actually to take ashram workers or anybody who was working with the parents at that point in those rural areas to fix it so they spent money on that and they saw a very vast increase in actually ensuring the fact that the the mothers as well as the children survive. So it's only in those situations, like in rural areas, since you will see a very strong cost benefit uh, point to the actual expenditure that you're making, that you will see any different sentence. I don't think you're going to really see that enough. Thank you, ma'am, for answering. Thank you so much. No problem. Ma'am, just like on the same lens, you know, you talk about how exactly how, you know, in rural areas, and it's actually probably more important because, you know, they have, they have their mental suffering intersects with a lot of other social issues that they are going through on an everyday basis. But those other social issues also obviously invite a lot of protests uh, from them, you know, towards the government, etc. So if, if the government is allocating X amount of budget to say employment, to food, 
and other things does it like is that one of the reasons that the government chooses not to invest enough in this because they think that there are already a lot of other issues that say these people are going through definitely i think that's absolutely one of the main problems the government is only going to do what some the government will try it's not like the governments are inherently bad or anything like that that's definitely not the case most governments work very like these fairly optimally actually and if you look at what the government will think of when they're spending is they also however think while that this is the right thing to spend money on if i go and tell this constituency that you know i spend money on mental health care whereas they really need money on water shortage there there's going to be an outreach like you mentioned on that aspect so even though it's needed clearly other things are pressing needs at that moment and what really sells in that area in terms of like uh, in that constituency is going to be really important on those points for example maternal health is something really important because the area and the people they recognize that as a problem domestic violence women and uh, women whose husbands are actually substance abusers so in a lot of areas in maharashtra you do have mental health services offered but it's offered for things like ensuring that men do not under like do not uh, have alcohol abuse or do not have drug abuse so that is something that's very viable and the government is willing to spend money on simply because like the people there themselves recognize that as a problem and are willing to see that you know services are coming through for that thank you so much ma'am i think that covers most of the questions that we have got um again once again thank you so much i think it's so important that we discuss the intersection of mental health with economics and policy in general and this session surely helped us all understand it much better we once again thank you for uh, coming in uh, if you have anything you would like to add at the end you can otherwise we can conclude the session uh no not surely i don't i don't think that's about it that's thank you so much bye bye